I know what you're probably thinking. A new missionary going out. She's probably going to be talking a lot about the scriptures. But you know what I'd really like to talk about? Captain America. And those of you who know me really well are probably really surprised right now. Like all superheroes, Captain America didn't start out being much at all. He was too small and he kept being rejected by the military. He had to be creative just to get in. And that, my friends, in the end, is what made him so great. Even at the pinnacle of his existence, he never made anyone feel small. That's because he knew what it was like to feel insignificant. And so it is with so many of our superhero stories. Batman's an orphan, Superman's planet was destroyed, and let's not even get into Spider-Man. But did these heroes let a tragic backstory turn them into villains? No way. The topic I've been given today is that missionary work is about preparing individuals and families for the blessings of the temple. In superhero terms, this means that I will be preparing everyday weaklings, like I have often found myself to be, for the blessings of Mount Olympus. <laughs> Sometimes superheroes are thought of as immortal. Moses 1 39 reads, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. I believe that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are the ultimate examples of superheroes because it is their work to find ways to help us become more like them. That's the purpose of everything. That's why we're sitting in this chapel right now. Sometimes when missionaries go out serving in the field, they develop a scoreboard in their head and they're keeping track of how many baptisms they get. But I've come to the realization that missionary work is really about preparing families for the, and individuals for the temple. Once they're baptized, that's when it's really beginning. And it will take all of the members working together with the missionaries in order for this to happen. I know well the feeling a person can get when they believe it would be impossible for them to become an immortal superhero or even make it to the temple. After all, people who don't know me often think that I'm 12 years old. Literally, you guys, Three days after my 18th birthday, I got handed a child's menu at a restaurant. <laughs> after I got my mission call, I was so excited. I said, hey mom, let's go practice right now. So we went around and we knocked on people's doors and we're like, Chile Santiago, yay! We were so excited. And we get to one house and a former bishop was there and he says, you can't go on a mission, you're 17. It's okay, I'll be gorgeous when I'm 30. <laughs> Luckily, I have seen that the Lord has given me many strengths I can develop to become a superhero, despite my perceived age and many other weaknesses that I have. I have the scriptures, I have the gospel, I have church attendance, and most importantly, I have the temple. But luck uh, there are many traits that a superhero must have that I believe going to and preparing the temple will help us to the temple will help us develop. That is overcoming trials, loving others, and preparing for eternal to, and preparing for preparing for eternity. You now I felt kind of lost when I was given this topic because at times I didn't feel quite up to the task. So I decided that I should go to the temple to organize my thoughts. But I was a little unprepared for the miracle that was about to happen. So um, my farewell at my home ward was last week, and on Wednesday, it was Tuesday then, and we realized that my friend from Washington was coming to visit the next night, so I had to go to the temple the next day, but my mom had work the next morning, so we decided we had to go to the 5.30 a.m. session at the Logan Temple, so we get up at 4 in the morning, and we feel pretty good about ourselves, hurrying really fast, and we get there, and we barely miss the session. And if we waited for the next one, my mom was going to be late for work. So the temple workers told us that we could sit in the chapel and feel the spirit of the temple and gather my, our thoughts for my talk. And it was really cool, actually, because the temple workers were at this prayer meeting, so we were actually kind of alone in the temple. And my mom says it was really cool because she's never experienced that before. So at first, we, we walked around, and we enjoyed the paintings, and then we, we sat down. And as we sat there in the temple, I was reminded of all the times in my life when I have overcome my personal trials. 
I was inspired with the thought of how through hard work, anyone can rise to any height, even superhero heights, even though it's not easy or natural for them. Before us in the chapel was a painting, and this was a painting of Jesus Christ just as he's after he'd risen on the third day. So he's standing here, and the tomb's behind him, and the rock is pushed to the side, and there's Mary Magdalene, and she's kneeling on the ground looking up in amazement that her Savior had risen. And this scene is described in Mark 16, 19. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, his, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. What inspired me about this painting was that Mary Magdalene was not perfect by any means. However, she was still the first person that Jesus Christ appeared to after he, is risen. he, did, he had risen. He didn't go straight to the rich or the famous or even his apostles. Even though Mary Magdalene was a sinner through our Savior, she had overcome her trials, just as I have overcome many in my life. Oftentimes, I think we get into this state of mind that we think that if we're a sinner and we go into church, we're going to get struck by lightning. When, um, in fact, the blessings of the temple are meant for those of us who aren't perfect. All of us, me included. The blessings of the temple are meant to strengthen and empower us to do better. If we were already perfect, why would we have come to earth? Why would we be tested right now? Uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple of sister missionaries spoke at my home ward, and they gave a story of how they love it when they're sitting in the chapel and they can smell someone who smells like cigarette smoke because it's not our place to judge them. In fact, they're right where they need to be. As we all know, um, President McDorf gave this, quoted a bumper sticker in a past general conference, and it says, don't judge me because I sin differently than you. Ether 12.27 says, and if men come unto me, I will show them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. <clears throat> to me, this scripture means that our struggles are going to be what get us to the temple and eventually the celestial kingdom. We were placed on this earth to learn and to grow. The reason why God allows us to be tried is so that we can become better. The temple is what prepares us for the celestial kingdom. Now, when I was in ninth grade, I started doing high school rodeo, and for three years, I was the worst rodeo queen ever. I was placing last every week. I was just the most awkward person in the whole world. And not only that, I was going through so many trials with my self-confidence and figuring out who I was. But then at the end of those three years, before my 11th grade year, I won a national pageant. And if I hadn't placed last those three years, I don't think I would have been able to do the things that I did. It really just boosted me into who I was and I just kept realizing, wow, I'm so blessed for the things that I've gone through. And I realized that if it hadn't been for those hard things, I would I would not be anywhere near who I am today. This, so, um, this was also apparent to me. I went to, exactly a month ago, I went to Lindsay Sterling's concert. And if you don't know her, you should probably look her up. She's amazing. She likes to play the violin and dance at the same time to electric uh, music, electronic music. She's super cool. I went to her concert, and she played this song called Take Flight. And during that song, she had her backup dancers, and they were kept doing things that would hold her back. And it looked really professional. It didn't look weird at all. But they put up the screen, and she couldn't go forward because the screen was in the way, and they'd go, and they just wouldn't let her dance. But then at the very end, she goes off to the side of the stage, and she's standing there, and this wind blows up on her, and it's just beautiful because she's in this gorgeous blue dress. And then she goes back onto the stage, and her dancers start lifting her up. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen because she is flying across the stage playing her violin. And it was very symbolic of it was the hard things, the things that held her back that eventually lifted her up in the end. And that's true for her life as well. She went on to America's Got Talent and basically got told she wasn't good enough. Now she sells out concerts. The temple is a place of learning and becoming better. better. My bishop in my word, my homeward often says, all gospel roads lead to the temple. President Monson said, as we make 
As we go to the Holy House, as we remember the covenants we make therein, we will be able to bear every trial and overcome each temptation. The temple provides purpose for our lives. It brings peace to our souls. Not the peace provided by men, but the, the peace provided by the promise of the, by the Son of God when he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, I give, and, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I believe that going getting to the temple is a process of overcoming trials. When I think of the world's view of heaven, you know, I think of, um, yeah, it's kind of a flower field and we sit around with our halos. These are the people who kind of had boring lives, but we were perfect, you know, because not much happened to us. And then when I think of our, the view of heaven I get by going through the, to the temple, I can't imagine it being like that. I think of heaven is going to be filled with the people who had to sacrifice. The people who got their hands dirty and lived a hard life but never gave up. You know, you don't see any superhero com comics of those average Joes who, yeah, I guess they save the world every once in a while. I think we can see the temple as our own superhero base. Saving the world is serious business. And our arch nemesis does not want us to succeed. In a world so filled with temptations and distractions, we need a sanctuary. We need a place of learning. I went on to LDS.org and I got this definition for why letters Latter-day Saints build temples, and I'm going to read it to you. From the days of old, the Old Testament, the Lord has commanded his people to build temples, sacred structures where he could teach, guide, and bless them. For example, the Lord told the Israelites to build a portable tabernacle that would be their temple while they traveled in the wilderness. Additional Old Testament references to the temples are found in 2 Chronicles and then a whole bunch of other scriptures. The Lord told the Israelites to build a portable, ta a portable tabernacle that would be their temple while they traveled in the wilderness. When Jesus Christ was on the earth, the only existing temple was known as the Temple of Herod. Jesus was often found in this temple. And I'm going to pause for a second. I have a friend who's on a mission. I asked him if he would send me some scriptures, and I'm going to read them, the ones he sent me from the Old Testament. So he says that all of 1 Kings chapters 6 and 7 are about building temp the temple. It's some pretty specific stuff, too. And then chapter 8 is the dedication of the temple. And then the Spirit of the Lord comes down. Leviticus 1.1 1, 1 is also pretty important because once the tabernacle was built, it became the only place where the Lord would personally appear to Moses and give him direction. And then another definition on LDS.org says, literally the house of the Lord. The Lord has always commanded his people to build temples, holy buildings in which worthy saints perform sacred ceremonies and ordinances of the gospel for, them, for themselves and for the dead. The Lord visits his temples and they are the most holy of all places to worship. After the rejection and death, of Jesus' apostles, there were no temples on the earth for many centuries. When the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored in the early 1800s, the Lord again commanded his people to build temples. The earliest temples of the restored church were, were built in Ohio, Illinois, and eventually in Utah. Today, the church has over 140 operating temples around the world. Regardless of the place or time period, temples are the most sacred place on earth. A place where earth and heaven meet and where we feel close to our Heavenly Father in Jesus. In 2 Nephi 5, it talks about how Nephi established his people. But the first thing he did was build a temple. And that is how his people became truly happy. They were a covenant people. That's what the temple is all about. Making covenants and to allow you to attain and to further happiness. And that's part of the reason why the Book of Mormon is so important. Left and right, it's all about temples, making covenants, and becoming happy. I've talked about it a lot, so on another note. I've talked about this a lot, but I've sure learned a lot through this, so I guess you can hear it again. I took a world religions class in Institute this last semester, and I honestly, I think that class taught me more about why I wanted to be a missionary than any other class. I truly learned a respect for all people, and I have a desire to go 
show these people in Chile and serve them and help them to become better. I have been reading Our Search for Happiness lately by Russell M. Russell Ballard, and I, I like a few quotes in there. It says, he says, when it comes right down to it, people are quite similar. We may come from different backgrounds, cultures, and economic circumstances, and our attitudes and perspectives may vary, but in the heart, we, where it really counts, we are a lot alike. And that's what I learned about most in my world religions class. I feel like we didn't sit around and say why all the other churches were wrong. In fact, I feel like we pointed out why they were right in the end. We didn't say, this is why we're better than them, and that's why they are wrong. And I just truly learned to respect and love them because at the core of every religion, it's the same. It comes down to, it comes from the same place. I can just see how through history, man has changed things and Satan hasn't wanted want us to have the truth. So on my mission, if I can't convert people to my own church, I at least want to convert them more fully to their own church to help them become better. But I've learned that the best way to help people to become better is to help prepare them for the temple, not by baptizing them and forgetting them. Now don't get me wrong, once you enter the temple, it's not a checkpoint where you can go, yay, I'm a superhero now. The temple is a door to the rest of your life. By no means does it mean it's going to be smooth sailing from there on out either. As we all know, after a superhero defeats one of their villains, one, just, one bigger and badder is right knocking right on their door after that. So we just keep going, keep going to the temple, and everything will turn out all right. Another thing that helped me prepare for my mission and also for the temple is about a week after I got my mission call, my, uh, my dog died. And I never, I've never lost anyone in my life who was closer to me than my dog. I, I've had him since I was eight years old. And before he died, my motivation to be a good person was the fact that I'd be able to make a world in the next life. I'd always be thinking, my world is going to have meat trees. That'd be pretty cool. Or something like that. But I realized that we don't have Sunday school classes where we hand out papers and say to the kids, okay, we're gonna design our worlds now. No, we have classes about family and how important families are. And I realized that if it means being together with my family again, if I can see my, my best friend since I was eight years old again, it doesn't matter. I don't care if I get to make a world or not. I just want to be with my family again and be able to be with my dog again. And I know that seems silly, but I just love him so much. Richard G. Scott said, one of the most beautiful, comforting doctrines of the Lord, one that brings immense peace happiness, and unbounded joy is the principle called eternal marriage. This doctrine means that a man and woman who love each other deeply, who love each other deeply, who have grown together through trials, joys, sorrows, and happiness of a shared lifetime, can live beyond the veil together, forever with their family who earn that blessing. It is not just an immensely satisfying dream. It is a reality. And that is a reality that gives me so much peace comfort, especially in losing my dog. And I believe that the reason why we as mortals are so excited about the stories of superheroes is how they offer us immense pictures of peace, happiness, and unbounded joy, just like the stories of living together with our families. These newfounded friends I meet in Chile will, be su will become superheroes as they prepare for and obtain the blessings of the temple. Do you want to know who my favorite superhero is? Jesus Christ. I have testimony that he died so that I could overcome my trials, so that I could become better and become all that I can be and reach to those superhero type heights. I also believe that he died for each and every one of you and everybody in Chile, and I'm so excited to go share that message with them. I truly have a hope for the future and for the life afterward because of what Jesus Christ did for me, and I am so glad that I can call him my hero, and I want to. I want to be just like him. I found that when I wake up from a dream at night where I'm the hero, I'm so happy. And I'm thinking, that's why I'm going to Chile. I want to be a superhero. It is my hope to be able to bring the residents within the Chile Santiago North Mission the belief that they, as they prepare for the blessings of the temple, can become superheroes. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.